see is it over here. You can also see how the corridor stops here. Very little vegetative cover left. And then begins again the normal story sequence. Again, for comparison, a little smaller way, which does retain some of the corridor vegetation. We can also get a tag over here. Summary table listing exactly how much we have for each soil type or vegetation type, for instance, telling us the loss of gain without <coughs> the map. We also have the capability of combining information into what we call a weighting scheme. This happens to be a suitability model for campgrounds, according to one man's opinion. The lighter cells, especially here on the west side of the valley, indicate the more suitable sites. And the darker cells, the least suitable sites. So this model happened to uh, take into account uh, vegetative cover, soil type, uh, slope, proximity to roads, proximity to closed lakes. We also have the capability of taking our vegetation types, for instance, and ranking them in uh, habitat quality. Craig has uh, spent a lot more time doing this, and you'll have a chance to see him tomorrow morning in a student paper present a few more of the details. And again, uh, as in any resource evaluation or environmental study, we have to make a choice among all of the alternatives. We must know these three things about our resources. We must know what we do have and where it exists. We have to know its quality. But we also have to know the gain or loss with the proposed action, or in other words, the trade-offs. But after looking at all those details, we must then put things back into their proper perspective. Thank you. He'll be giving you a talk on the multi-uses of the Skunk River water. Thank you. It may seem strange to you to have a professor of civil engineering come over here and talk to you, a wildlife conclave. You also should know that my specialty is sanitary engineering, and that means that I'm one of the few engineers on campus who is both civil and sanitary at the same time. <laughs> and if you think about it just a little bit, you can be assured that we have connections with all the best people. <laughs> now, why am I here? If you believe everything that you read, the civil engineer is to blame for all that wildlife people and environmentalists complain about. We, shape, we reshape the environment, and I have to raise the hypothetical question, always Detrimentally, question mark. We build big dams. 
we proposed a big dam here in central Iowa to create the Ames Reservoir for a number of specific purposes. Now I have to raise the question, why did it happen and how did it happen? Now the role of the civil engineer is now and always has been, and I suspect it always will be, to make use of engineering and scientific principles to design, construct, and operate structures that will perform a useful function to serve mankind. Now the civil engineer usually works in the public sector, and it's the public, through your Congress or through your elected officials, who establish the useful function and the evaluation procedures that are used in evaluating structures to achieve that useful function. The role of the engineer is to try to provide the structure needed while he maximizes the benefits and minimizes the costs. And whenever the benefits exceed the cost, or we have a, what we call a benefit cost ratio greater than one, the public has usually said, go, build the structure. And whenever the costs exceed the benefits, the public has generally said, stop, because if we don't get more back on our dollar, then don't spend the dollar. The problem is that the costs don't stand still for the five to 20 years needed to start and finish a project. As an example, the interest rate has gone from 3.5% to over 9% in the last three or four or five years. The price of corn and soybeans more than tripled in one year. And therefore, a cost analysis that is made today may be outmoded tomorrow. And the benefits today may actually be costs tomorrow. For example, uh, the money spent to divert the interstate highway around the Ames Reservoir site uh, was a benefit at that time because it preserved the site. And if the reservoir isn't built, it becomes a cost because there's no benefit from it. Now, my job is to, to this morning is to explain what was expected of the proposed Ames Reservoir. And to do that, we have to look at the historical development of the United States. Because that historical development took place along rivers and waterways. And the reason for it is that at the time of the development of this country, the major transportation system was by flatboat, then steamboat, and now barge. Also, by locating along rivers, population centers had a readily available water supply. They were able to develop a water carriage system of disposing of their waste. And if they fished upstream from town, and from town instead of downstream, they had a place for swimming and for fishing. And as a result of this, most of our major population centers in the United States, and Ames is no exception, have developed along riverbanks. And the farmers have centered some of their major agricultural activities along the rich floodplain land centered along either side of the river. And the sl slide of the Skunk River below Ames showed a two to three mile wide floodplain uh, which is used for extensive, profitable farming. Now, over the years, the use of rivers and floodplain land and the location of cities along rivers has been bothered by two problems. First, either too much water, which we refer to as floods, where there is damage to the crops or to the structures that are located in the floodplain. Or there has been times when we have too little water, where we have times of drought, and there is damage to crops because of lack of water. 
damage to the water supply of a city because there was no water there to obtain. There was no water there to dilute the wastewater streaming from the cities and the industries. And there was a lack of water to support an adequate fish and wildlife population. Now, historically, the turn was to big dams. And you might ask the question, why? Well, we, we resorted to dams because dams provided a solution to both problems, the problems of floods and the problems of drought. Secondly, we turned to big dams because you, the public, were easier to convince that this was the solution to the problem since we could center the solution on one structure in one location instead of the multiple types of structures and the involvements of multiple disciplines and people in diverse area and the creation of funds from many different sources in order to solve the problem. For example, today, you have authorized Congress to provide funding for structures like the Ames Reservoir construction, but you have not yet funded or authorized Congress or had Congress authorized the development of greenbelt systems, such as you'll hear more about this morning. A third reason for big dams is that they have been tremendously successful. For example, in 1951, the Missouri-Kansas Kansas River flood at Kansas City caused over $1 billion of damage. That's $2 billion in today's prices. And yet, the construction of the Missouri River Dam System, Gavin's Point, Fort Randall, Fort Peck, Oahe, and others, in 1973, reduced a potentially as damaging flood to negligible damage proportion. In other words, the construction of big dams has been successful. With that, I would like to move out to a series of slides to discuss why dams uh, are used for multi purposes. flow, which tends to flood out over the farmland and 
today. Now, in the design of re reservoirs, con Congress has dictated that we consider, consider multi-purposes for that reservoir. And thus, we designed reservoirs for local augmentation to support fish and wildlife, to support water supply, to support water pollution control. We also designed a reservoir for recreation and for flood control. Unfortunately, however, there are conflicts in the multi-purpose use of such reservoirs. For floods, we would like to have the reservoir empty, and we would create a problem for the other uses since there would be no reservoir there, no water in the reservoir for recreation. There would be no water there to protect against drought, and we would have a much flat. If we want to use the reservoir for, rec for recreation, we would like to have the reservoir always full and at a constant water level. In that case, if we're going to try and maintain a constant water level, we have no flood protection storage, nor do we have any storage of water for release during periods of drought. If we want to use the reservoir primarily for low flow augmentation, we would like to have the reservoir full at all times, but permit a variable level, so that when the natural flow in the river is down, we can release water from the reservoir in order to meet our need for low flow augmentation. In that case, we have no flood protection, we have poorer recreation, we have poorer protection of our fish and wildlife. Now, one of the things that uh, I would like to make clear is that the Ames Reservoir is probably finished, but it is not finished because of its damage to any specific item or its lack of use in any specific way. The principal reason that the Ames Reservoir is finished is when it is constructed, the benefits to be derived from it are less than the cost of the reservoir itself when calculated on data uh, agreed upon in 1972. If we re-evaluated the reservoir today on the basis of the increased price of corn and soybeans, we would significantly increase the value of the reservoir for flood protection, and we might be faced with, again, a reservoir which has a benefit cost ratio greater than one. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about all of the multi uses. Let me talk about a few very briefly. Let's look at recreation. Less than 1% of the land in Iowa is publicly owned. Today, there is less than five acres of lake per thousand people in the state of Iowa. The Ames Reservoir, as proposed, would create 7,000 acres of new publicly owned land and put it available for the use of the citizens of Iowa. It would create 2,100 acres of lake within 5 to 10 miles of a population of 65,000 people. In other words, for this region, the acres of lake would increase to about 30 to 32 acres per thousand population. One of the difficulties in assessing the benefit from recreation is how much money do we accord or are we willing to spend for a day of recreation on uh, land like we saw in the previous slide or land on the lake. And obviously that's a political question because if you talk to a sailboater, he will be he will have a different opinion from that of a hydro. Uh, necessary in the evaluation of a reservoir is a determination of the dollar benefits of recreation. And the one thing that everyone I think will recognize is that this reservoir would put land in public ownership, which is not done. Uh, under some of the other alternatives. Let's look at water supply for just a moment. Because one of the useful uh, parts of a reservoir is its use for a lot. In 1970, the city of Ames is using about five to six million gallons per day of water drawn from a surficial aquifer. 
the water flows out of the Sun River into the aquifer to recharge the source of the Ames water supply. The capacity currently of this water supply with the drought type of flow from the Sunk River is about 17 million gallons of water per day. A, the sure supply of water. <coughs> By the year 2020, depending on what population prediction we depend on, the city of Ames will need anywhere from 10 to 19 million gallons of water per day. And if we need 19 million gallons of water per day dependably, the only way we can get that water is to increase the low flow during drought periods in the Sun River so that we can increase the direct recharge from the river into the superficial aquifer. This can be done by the storage in the Ames Reservoir. As an alternate to this, Ames will have to drill deep wells into aquifers several thousand feet down and will encounter a water of poorer quality, a water which is more difficult to treat and more costly for the city of Ames. Therefore, in evaluating the, cost, the benefits of the Ames Reservoir to water supply, we have two problems. Number one, we won't need the water until after the turn of the century. And secondly, the, the benefit is derived by low flow augmentation, and it is only a small amount of water that we will need in addition. Therefore, uh, the cost of or the, the cost of providing the benefit may in fact uh, be greater than its benefit. And in the analysis, we found that if we're considering interest rates at seven percent, and we use a medium population prediction, the value of the Ames Reservoir for water supply to the city of Ames is only one thousand four hundred and thirty dollars per year. If the population expands at the high rate predicted, the Ames Reservoir is worth about six thousand dollars to the city of Ames, starting today for water supply to be supplied in, in 2020. Thus, the benefit of the Ames Reservoir for water supply is relatively low. Now let's look at the benefit for water quality control. Now water quality control has been established as a public good and the Department of Environmental Quality and Environmental Protection Agency have classified rivers into four categories. General classification, public water supply, recreation, aquatic life to protect both warm water and cold water fish. Now, so happens that the Skunk River, south of Ames, has been classified as a warm water fishing stream, and we need to establish criteria to protect warm water fishing. This means that we need to maintain an oxygen level of 4 milligrams per liter in the river at all times. 5 milligrams per liter for a period of at least 16 hours a day. And the ammonia nitrogen concentration in the river must be less than 2 milligrams per liter because of its to potential toxicity to fish. Here's the problem. The city of Ames on the Slump River has a drainage area on the squat and the stump of 556 square miles. And the seven day, 10 year low flow, which is the flow in the river, which must be protected for fish at the city of Ames is point, point 0.16 cubic foot per second of water. Whereas the discharge from the Ames water pollution control plant is six cubic feet per second. That means that at Ames, under the new public policy to protect fish and wildlife, the water discharged from the Ames pollution control plant must meet the quality of the water that we have in the river. One of the advantages of the Ames Reservoir is that the percent time the flow is equal or exceeded, and this is the flow, the peak flow up here of 8 or 9 or 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 or 50,000 cubic foot per second of water can be reduced to a level of about 1,000 CFS. And the water which is stored here can be let out here so that the minimum flow of water in the Sunk River can be increased to somewhere between 25, 40 to 50. 
cubic foot per second. In other words, the minimum flow goes from nothing to 50 cubic foot per second A wire which is useful for water supply and useful for pollution of wastewater. Uh, the actual level is a function of the number of years in which over, which we wish to guarantee protection uh, from low flow. And that, if you want to protect for a 100 year drought, uh, we can release 25 CFS. If we want to protect against a 10 year drought, we can release about 50 cubic foot per second to maintain that minimum flow in the river. Now, if you look at a typical sewage, and this is one of the things I think there's a common misunderstanding. Uh, the thing we're worried about are the solids in sewage. And if you take a ton of sewage, a ton of sewage, we're concerned about one pound of solids. And it's that one pound of solids that we're trying to remove from the river water, or uh, the wastewater before we dump it back into the river. If we don't remove it, uh, the carbon in being converted to carbon dioxide and the nitrogen in the waste in that solid being converted to nitrate will use oxygen. And if the supply of oxygen in the river water is not sufficient, we can have a degradation in the water, in the dissolved oxygen level below the point of discharge and drop it below four milligrams per liter and kill fish. So the purpose of local augmentation or wastewater treatment is to maintain the oxygen level always greater than four milligrams per liter. In order to do that, in order to protect against a 4 DO in the river, the DOD in the river must be maintained at a level below about 7 milligrams per liter. The DOD, the oxygen demand on the part of the waste. this level 
level per year to this level per year, and this would be the value of the Ames Reservoir to the city of Ames for water pollution control. To summarize, then, uh, if we use the 7% interest figure, which is prevalent today, flood control, protection of crops downstream, is worth $537,000 per year uh, to the farmers south of Ames. For water quality control for the city of Ames, we have a value of about $105,000 per year. For a water supply, $1,400 per year. And for recreation, $385,000 per year. And predominantly the reason that the Ames Reservoir probably is ended is because the benefits are only 43 cents for every dollar of cost. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bowman. Dr. Mer Merwin Dougal is the Associate Professor of, Civil, Professor of Civil Engineering at Iowa State University. He is also the leader of the Iowa Water Resources Research Institute that did the study I was talking about in 1972. And he will be talking on the Ames Reservoir Environmental Study. Dr. Dougal. Thank you. You've 
heard a comprehensive explanation of the Ames Reservoir, and it takes one. One is needed to show the amount of study and the technical factors that go along with resource development. And that's one thing we want to discuss this morning. We've had reviewed now then, and by the first speaker, Paul Anderson, the natural attributes of the valley, its scenic, its scenic uh, advantages, the natural resources that are there, and it shows you at least what one part of this particular environmental study team produced. The second speaker has showed us the usefulness of a reservoir in solving problems. It's a water resources development project. It's designed to meet man's needs. It can satisfy some things we need to do. Or we must look for alternatives, and that becomes the next key issue. What kind of alternatives exist in this framework? The reservoir certainly would change the picture, and most of you, I think, have grasped that already. I think in terms of explaining a few words and some meaning, we might look at three words. Uh, what Paul Anderson showed you, showed most of you students, at least those of 10 or 15 years ago, you had a location in which the word was woodsies. In other words, a boy and a girl in a blanket was the merchandise needed. Uh, apparently, the last few weeks now we have streakies in which you don't need much of anything perhaps except courage. I always explain to the students in explaining reservoirs and what they can do is that we really introduce a new word and that's floatsies, in which the boy and girl now need, in addition to uh, what they may, may or may not have needed in the other two, simply is an air mattress and they go floating off in the water. Well, the next thing we must look at now, following these two speakers, is the NEPA the National Environmental Policy Act of 1969, because that certainly brought into this resource development picture a new concept. And we begin to recognize about this time with the space age that we have a finite amount of non-renewable resources in the world. The spaceship Earth concept came into being and will be with us in a long time in the future. So what we're saying today, really, in resource development is we want to take a very careful look at it. We want to look at the use picture on a long-term approach. And we want to look at alternatives in terms of resource commitments. And so from that NEPA Act, the so-called ARES, or ARES study, came into being. And so we want to show how we frame this environmental resources study, which incidentally was sponsored by the Corps of Engineers as a requirement to meet the NEPA Act. In other words, they felt that this particular study could be very useful to them, especially in deciding then whether to continue with the project or whether then to uh, shelve it and take other alternatives to solve water problems. So Iowa State University then was assigned this particular contract to do an environmental resource study and determine what should be done with this particular reservoir project. What about the problems? What about the solutions? And to frame this and to cover it comprehensively then, we canvassed the faculty at Iowa State University to see what groups were interested, also to frame ourselves what things should be done so that we didn't have any gaps in the knowledge. We might use a first slide then and just show at least the five major areas that were defined in making this particular study. Number one, I don't know whether you need to dim the lights one time or not. I don't think you need them clear off. But uh, the first category that we wanted to work with is one that Paul Anderson has already reported on, and that's the natural and archaeological resources of the valley itself. The reservoir site and the stream system as resource entities. What was there and how useful was it to us? The second one, second group, the social and economic impact group. What Sociological considerations, what economic factors were going to come into being and doing this. We just heard at the conclusion now that words interest rate discount factors come into being. The third group is the outdoor recreation open space group, a major use of the reservoir area, a major use of the valley itself. The fourth categorical group working with us was the agricultural influence and effects group. In other words, what was the agricultural role in this particular valley? And the fifth is the urban influence, a great deal of which Dr. Bauman has now explained. 
What are the urban needs, the urban effects, the urban influence on this particular valley? Let's just review a little bit in detail then what these groups did uh, frame as an initial study element. So let's go ahead to the next slide. And we see that we have then the competitive role of the reservoir in this resource picture. The identification of the natural and archaeological resources and determination of the uniqueness of the area. So we had then a rather large scale, you might say the natural scientists participated in category one. In the second group in terms of the social impact then, the relationship of the reservoir to people. In other words, what are the thoughts of the people? What are their reactions, the social response to a particular water resource development project? And how do the people feel that a valley should be used? The uh, relationship to the regional national economic picture, something very important to us today. So does this add to the economic viability of this region? Perhaps would it add to the attractiveness to attract other people to here to help develop more of an urban environment? And direct and indirect production related effects, direct and indirect consumption. So what are the uh, effects on resource utilization? The third group, the outdoor recreation open space, are the existing types and amounts of use, the complementary and competitive nature of proposed water recreation activities, the area of influence, the participation, the values of recreation. How much recreation do we think we need? The agricultural uh, group had these particular study elements, the relationship between agriculture, the stream system, and the reservoir. And most of us realize today we have a highly productive agricultural environment and it relies heavily on fertilizers, and we have a substantial livestock production in this valley, and so the stream system responds to the residues from these. The land use, the erosion, sedimentation, watershed management, agricultural water quality, drainage, flood damage picture. Agricultural flood damages are about, at the time of the study, about 50% of the benefits, for instance. And the last one, the urban one, the urban group that Dr. Bauman has reported on at this time, Relationship between urban uses, the urban growth patterns, the water supply, water quality, ur urban floodplain management, miscellaneous urban needs. And so this is the way the study was split up. We did this because we did then have a manageable division of the responsibility of making a comprehensive resource review study. Over 17 disciplines were involved along with then about 50 faculty and students, both graduate students, undergraduate students, everybody participated in it. I think we all learned, first of all, how to work together. And I think we all learned a lot more about each other's discipline as you have this morning and listening to the two speakers thus far. We had students in landscape architecture, botany, forestry, zoology, fish and wildlife, sociology, archaeology, geology, geography, economics, agricultural engineering, civil engineering, agronomy, outdoor recreation, the uh, forestry students, the civil engineering, sanitary engineering, urban planning groups. And so you see it really was a rather broad scale type of development and we actually had lots of interaction among these various groups. Let's look then at some of the results of doing this particular study and show the kinds of things that came out of it and then we'll go and summarize it and then we'll let the last speaker take over in terms of alternative development patterns. If we look at the next slide, the regional reservoir picture in Iowa, we realize that water resource development is part of the national development picture. And we have had several major reservoirs constructed in the state of Iowa. We have Coralville Reservoir in eastern Iowa. We have uh, Red Rock Reservoir completed, second one completed on Des Moines River below Des Moines, Des Moines being at this point. The third one completed is Rathbun Reservoir down in southern Iowa, in which we now have added 14,000 acres around 2,000 acres here. We have around 9,000 acres in the conservation pool here and 14,000 acres at Rathbun. And so we've added considerably to the water resource availability and the outdoor water-oriented recreation capability here in the state of Iowa. The next large reservoir being completed is Sailorville Reservoir on the Des Moines River north of Des Moines. And that completes probably some of the largest reservoirs we'll ever build in Iowa and is one of the one of our scientists has said here at Ames, we're moving into the second generation of reservoir construction and the Ames Reservoir shows that. We're now working with smaller reservoirs on some of the smaller streams. 
The next picture shows a nine county area of influence that uh, the people in this particular region would be able to use the valley here. They would especially be attracted to it if we added the water environment. So we have here a nine county area, Webster, Hamilton, Hardin, Boone, Story, Marshall, Dallas, Polk, and Jasper counties. And they're within a easy driving range, at, at least an easy driving distance before the last few months. If the gas shortage gets a more concern, then perhaps localized things become more important to us. But be as it may, a reservoir at this point would attract people, including the Polk County area. Now, as we work at this, there are interactions. And certainly at Polk County in Des Moines, the fact that we will have Sailorville with a Big Creek subimpoundment here, the fact that we have the Red Rock Reservoir here, and we also have down below Rathbun, uh, those areas also serve as attractive areas for Polk County people. So there's only a residue of Polk County people that might move this way. We certainly wouldn't expect all of them to come this way. Be as, be as it may, this nine county area contains the people that are going to use resources. And the next picture shows some of the population levels, and it's not a small number. We have over 500,000, 560,000 people today in this nine county region. And as we forecast out in the future, we're talking about the central Iowa region with a considerable amount of urban development. And so it could easily double, easily at the maximum level double, or it could at least increase by 50% the median growth pattern would actually increase by s about 75% up into the year 2020 or 50 years from now. And so these people are going to exercise demands on the environment and have their own resource utilization. If we look at the next slide, we'll begin to see the nine alternative development patterns that were introduced in this study. Alternative one was to work with the large-scale multipurpose project as proposed by the initial design memorandum. It would include the major impoundment at 2,100 acres, two sub-impoundments for recreation, the dam site lake at 30 acres, and Bear Creek sub-impoundment at 150-some acres. We prefer, in these multi-purpose reservoirs in Iowa, to have these sub-impoundments for recreation. At Coralville, we have Lake McBride. Red Rock, we have the, uh, an area set aside by the Marion County Group the Roberts Creek Lake area, and at Sailorville we'll have the, we do have already the Big Creek Lake, an 880-acre lake, along with the Sailorville project. Constant level lakes for recreation, with a minimum of power boating on those smaller impoundments. We're using sail boating and less than six horsepower limits on Big Creek, Roberts Creek, and the Lake McBride. So with those particular ones, we do have then fishing. We have sailboating with very little conflict between uses. We have the major reservoirs then for water skiing, large boat activities. Now, it costs money to build the sub-impoundment, so alternative 1A was to drop them out and just use the large-scale multi-purpose project itself. The economics group wanted to look at recreation only. In other words, if we're selling multi-purpose reservoirs on its recreation potential, then why don't we just look at what a recreation lake would do? And so we have here then a 1,400-acre recreational lake as a single-purpose project. Then we move into other considerations. What happens if we drop out the major reservoir and solve water problems other ways and work with a water-enhanced environment for recreation by using the Bear Creek sub-impoundment and the dam site lake with a green belt concept? So this was alternative three. The other five alternatives are on the next slide. First of all, a minimum green belt, very little acquisition. Second, alternative 4A was a maximum green belt concept in which we would hope to purchase up to 1,400 acres with another almost 3,000 acres under easement, so we would control about 4,000. We're doing that because, as an alternative, because the original project, as Dr. Bauman pointed out, would add around 7,000 acres into the public land use sector. And to most of us, with the no hunting, the, no, the uh, no trespassing signs we see in this valley to date, we realize that we do need public access to an area that has about 25% of the timber in Story County and has a great deal of usefulness in terms of the recreational patterns. And the question is, how are you going to achieve it? So by minimum greenbelt, we have one method. By maximum greenbelt, we hope to enhance it back towards what the reservoir might provide in open space. 
<clears throat> Alternative 5 was, was introduced by the University of Iowa Economics Group because the Corps of Engineers points out that if it cannot gain a sponsor, it must gain either a local or state sponsor to share 50 percent of the cost of that recreational development. If it can't obtain it, then it would simply provide minimum facilities. In other words, it would provide a gate, an entrance, some uh, latrines, and that would be the end of it. So we looked at the proposed project, 2,100 acres of water, but minimum development, and see what it would produce. Now that would be, in the estimate of our economics people, quite a short-sighted viewpoint. How can you provide 2,100 acres of water next to a community of 40 to 50,000 people and not provide facilities? The clamor that you would hear probably would go all the way to the governor's office and back to Congress in doing that. But yet, if you don't have a local sponsor, you face that. Alternative six was to look at a reduced scope project. Multi-purpose projects with fluctuating flood pools cause a lot of problems. We're backing water up to Story City. To lessen the impact on the vegetation in the reservoir, we reduced the size of this project and took a look at it that way. Now, the NEPA Act requires you also to look at the do-nothing alternative. Status quo, do-nothing. Well, there's no status quo too much in the Skunk River Valley. The do-nothing alternative implies to us that residential housing will continue to creep across the countryside and pretty well use up the valley's resources and would place and keep it most of it in private ownership. And once you get that much residential development, you won't have much open space capabilities left. All right, this means then that we have established nine alternatives. We have five study groups, and they simply went at it and studied the situation now. We had a lot of joint meetings and came up then with the overall results. Some of these uh, I think we've had before. We can kind of go through the slides and look at them. Category one certainly looked at the natural resource picture that we had. And this shows the reservoir site study. Uh, one result we've already talked about is that the interstate highway was proposed through the middle of this area. It would have gone right, as you look at the Soper's Mill area, realize that the interstate highway as proposed would have gone right through the middle of the Soper's Mill area, would have required replacement of the bowstring bridge, and would have gone up through this area, back across, and gone up again. Over $1 million was allocated from the water resource development funds of the national government into the highway trust fund to pay for the fact that by not going straight through this, we require that road user to go around and add a few tenths of a mile to his annual distance traveled. That amortized value had to be allocated from the water development funds into the transportation funds. It actually, we estimated, was cheaper to build the project around the reservoir because instead of two sets of dual bridges, we needed one set here at the Bear Creek, uh, Creek itself. And so in this whole game of conservation uh, balance, these kinds of things come into it. It's actually cheaper to go around than to go through. But the annual road user cost of going longer distance around paid for that uh, proposal to go straight through the reservoir. Be as it may, the shifting of this project actually left the valley rather uh, interrupt, uninterrupted. And so that allocation of funds today, you, if we don't build the reservoir, you're going to allocate it to environmental enhancement. In other words, we're really amortizing out an annual cost of having a better valley for environmental enhancement than we would have with the highway straight through the area. Most of us kind of reflect today on how would the Highway Commission today would have liked to have proposed building that highway through the valley requiring uh, an environmental impact statement. In other words, if we, we don't went back through that whole process once more, we'd have much different answers, I'm sure, even there. Well, the ne next slide shows, I think, the, uh, some of the archaeological results that, that we had from the Group 1. This shows that there were something like 50-some uh, sites of archaeological interest all the way up the valley, especially in the bluff lands around this area. And these have been identified, inventory, and then the impact and analyzed on them. And certainly we foresee, or they, that group for, could foresee, tremendous problems no matter what alternative you pick. Even residential development is a threat then to these archaeological resources that have been identified. And these include all the way back to the early Indian traditional areas, back clear up into the what's called the Euro-American or the settler, the pioneer settler in this region. The, uh, Forest areas certainly pointed out that 25% of the forest land in Story County is in this particular study area. 
25 uh, percent, and of that, about three fourths would be involved with the reservoir project. And certainly, the 1,700 acres uh, in that 7,000 acres that would be purchased by the federal government, some of it's in the conservation pool would be eliminated. Other parts would be in the flood pool, in which we'd have periodic loss of some of it, and then some of it, rest of it's in the fringe areas. And so there are uh, forest impact in this area, and being in the one of the large forest areas in the county is of concern to us. The thing that we probably don't get out of some of the model work that we have done here and the work that uh, Paul Anderson showed was what changes one could take place and could make in the future. What would reforestation do to a county if you really went into a reforestation program? The next slide would show that, if we got a gap in there, all right. If we look at the, the outdoor recreation uh, group and what they did accomplish in their studies. This shows some of the outdoor recreation and the environmental factors we have in this nine county region. Ames and the Ames reservoirs in this area. We're going to have other river areas. You saw the, the both the satellite and the Skylab uh, photos of this particular region. And you're, if you remember a little bit from it, the valley over in the Des Moines River Valley is much more wooded than the Skunk River Valley. It's much wider. It has about 300 feet of relief compared to 100 feet of relief that we have. And so it becomes a much uh, more highly desirable aesthetic valley, valley than we would have here. So these things have to be taken into account in your overall regional studies. If we lose, if we lose the river environment here because of the reservoir, and if you want a river environment, you're requiring people then to go either up to the Boone River, the Des Moines River in this area, or to the Iowa River Greenbelt in this area, or to move on downstream into some other area. And so you can begin to look at the distance involved in terms of an effect. But this shows us the water areas, Big Creek, Sailorville Reservoir. We do have over at Boone, up at this point, we do have Don Williams Lake, County Recreation Lake. We have our own Story County Recreation Lake over here, and we have one up by Webster City. So we do have some constructed lakes as well as the river environment in doing this. The next slide would show that, that in the particular reach we have here, we've identified presently that we have rest areas here, McFarland Park with a small constructed lake, Soper's Mill access, an access area up at the Anderson H Street, the river, and then we have the Story City golf course and the floodplain at this location. The rest of this land then is privately owned. And this is what Professor Bauman, we both of us want to, wanted to emphasize, that the reservoir project would put 7,000 acres into public ownership. And so if, if both young and old people like to have open space availability without trespassing, then that's one method of doing it. Our alternative programs have to hope to achieve a measure of doing that, or we should compare it in that vein. The next slide shows a little bit of the water availability that Dr. Bauman talked about. This shows the acres per capita on the abscissa. This happens to be for the, the uh, low population. This is shown for the median population group. But in terms of years in the future, we are at the present time in completing Saterville, moving from about five acres per thousand capita up to over 20, up to 15 at least with the Saterville Reservoir. And if we add the Ames project to it, we'd be up to around 20 acres per thousand capital with water. As our population grows in the future, then this will decrease unless we add to it. So one of the things we really need to know, you see, is how much water area do we need for recreation? How much water area do we need for the outdoor recreation demand? And we better learn about it because if we do need it, we should be able to want to study to provide it. And certainly it has a lot to do with the economic growth, has a lot to do with income levels, has a lot to do with people's desires and how much tax money they're willing to support in doing this type of thing. The next slide shows a little bit of what the recreation people found out about recreational patterns. And in terms of years in the future and the activity days that you would have for attendance, you can see how some of these development patterns go along. And the highest demand that we could show would be the estimate with the reservoir with the proposed sub impoundments will give us the highest attendance levels. However, the dollar value is not quite as great as you might have for other uses, depending on whether you feel that the reservoir gives you a greater dollar value per day than a green belt might. The next slide. 
Charles, the Greenbelt program that's going to be, that was worked out, and this is where the next group will actually start to look at things. This shows a maximum Greenbelt concept, of which about 1,400 acres could be placed into purchase. We need to purchase the stream channel and the adjacent bank level, so we do have canoe access. And we also need control, and we desired in looking at this one simply to buy up everything on this strip next to the interstate. Some of it's fairly level farmland. However, in to uh, have less intensity for fish and wildlife, we think it would be a good thing. The west slopes then would have to be controlled by zoning, by large-scale residential lot development, and this type of thing, because you would have these particular things in it. Now, just to summarize some of the results that we've had in these various categories, then uh, I think we've had a good explanation of group one in terms of its natural resource attributes. We do have sand and gravel limestone excavations here in which there is monetary return of a large value. And these are things that you can't simply zone out of existence, and it's very costly. So a lot of the development patterns you have, the sand and gravel excavation through the sand and gravel quarry.